third Tuesday of the month. And here we are again, third Tuesday of the month. How so. many have we done this year now? 20. I mean, five. Well, we've learned Four. something. We've learned something every time. Yes. So okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and start. If you joined a nature nerd night before, you kind of know how it starts. If not, you're all in for a treat. All right. Ready? So if, if you're, you're a nature love and science nerd, we think that you just might be happy like us to start Nebraska nature nerd night. Turtles, fish, and bird of risk, disease, and fungi too. You're a curious brainiac. We've got a show for you. It literally be a little better every time. Just a little. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Thank you. If you haven't joined a nature nerd night, thanks for coming on tonight. Tonight we are um, getting really niche. -y. Yeah, we're getting niche. -y. Um, maybe we'll learn what a niche is tonight. Maybe. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we're going to be talking about um, wildlife research wonders that are happening within our own agency. So really specifying down to what wildlife research is happening, what um, has happened in the past, and kind of what discoveries that we've made. So. Yeah. Very exciting topic. I feel like we're always asking about this and learning some cool stuff. And we have a lot of public people that ask about it as well. Right. And we're so, glad to share that with you guys tonight. Exactly. So we have a panel of experts here tonight um, that are representing some cool stuff happening here in the agency and in the state with our partners. And we're going to let them introduce themselves because we have a handful. Um, so um, let's start with you, Sean, if you want to say your name and your position and then speak to really briefly, what is your role in the greater world of wildlife research? So my name is Sean Dunn. I'm the natural heritage zoologist for Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. That's my big title. Um, I try to, in terms of research, I try to answer the questions of how our populations of insects, um, herps sometimes, and uh, small non-game mammals. So things, things like bats and rats, shrews, mice, things like that. Uh, how those populations are doing and try to answer questions about where they're going, what things influence uh, those populations, and uh, how can we make sure that those populations continue uh, and, and maintain. That's great. He's, he's uh, also our bug guy, too. He's our bug guy. Not tonight. to reduce him to that, but like we go to Sean. I try. Him. Yeah, I, do, exactly. I do have a soft spot for the insects. So. That's so great. Everybody, everybody needs a bug guy or girl <laughs> or girl. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sean, thank you so much. Will, let's hear from you. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Inselman. Uh, I uh, was recently, um, well, I recently left the Game and Parks Commission, but as when I was with the Game and Parks Commission, I was the, the head of the entire wildlife research section for the agency. Um, and there I oversaw and kind of dabbled in just about every realm of research that we did across the state with all of the, the lovely people that are on here tonight that are going to be talking with me as well. Um, you know, from, from beetles to rattlesnakes to um, birds to mountain lions to elk, you name it, anything in the state I was kind of involved in. Um, and now recently moved over to Lower Platte South NRD as the resources coordinator, where now I'm, I'm doing some of that stuff, but uh, now at a more local scale and working a little more with beetles now with Sean. So um, yeah, kind of a wide range of experience and, and time across the state. Thank you so much, Will. And we missed him so much. We had him back on our show. We did. So we, he's never going to get away from us. Yep, exactly. Thanks, Will. Um, Colleen, you want to go? Good evening, everybody. I'm Colleen Rothy Grillo. And I'm the, the data technician and a biologist for the Nebraska Natural Heritage Program. And what we do over here is we track all of the species of greatest conservation needs. So our threatened and endangered species and species that we just don't know enough about and species that we are really concerned about. And we decided, oh, we, we need to fix this. We need to do something to protect these species. So I'm the one that manages the database. And basically when a research starts, I'm, I'm the first stepping stone so I can tell folks, what we need to know, where, where we have information, where, where we don't have information, that kind of thing. And I'm a herpetologist. And, oh, don't forget that. Herpetologist. Don't forget that. I feel like she's our turtle lady. Yeah. I don't know. Reptile turtle lady. Yeah. Plus our data person. <laughs> yeah. Like, and our data behind person. the scenes exactly. data person here. So. Super important. I'm yes. sure we'll hear more about tonight. Thanks, Colleen. Um, I'll just go next to you on my screen. Joel, you want to go next? Hi everyone, I'm uh, Joel Jorgensen. I'm the non-game bird program manager. So I'm a little focused just on kind of one group 
um, non-game birds. Um, so the birds that aren't hunted, we have other people that deal with waterfowl um, and then also the upland game birds like pheasants. So I get to focus on the other, let's say 400 or so species that occur in the state and really kind of involved um, with kind of all facets of, of wildlife research um, from, you know, conception to, um, you know, data collection to summarizing results and everything else. So I'm, I'm pretty fortunate in the, in the role I get to play. Also, add to your title is Peregrine Falcon Rescuer from the Capitol, too. Occasionally, that is one of the sub, <laughs> sub, uh, subtitles. Yeah, occasionally we see him in the paper for hanging That's out true. Peregrine Falcon. Yes. You know. Never in so, the office. Someone has but... to have a job like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Right. And, and last, um, Jen, you want to go ahead? I'm Jen Corman. I am a coordinating wildlife biologist for Northern Prairies Land Trust, which is a partnership position with Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. So I'm based out of Bassett in North Central Nebraska. Uh, and I'm a bit like support staff for the rest of these folks who focus a lot more on um, research. Most of my, my work duties involve working on habitat improvement projects with private landowners. And in order to do that, I cover a lot of ground and work with a lot of different community members. And so um, my role is to be the person on the ground who can um, collect data on request or connect researchers with landowners who are willing to provide access for that research. Um, and I also take some of those research results and then uh, um, relay those to private landowners who are trying to improve wildlife habitat on their property. So I kind of get the bookend parts of the, the research that the agency does. Oh, and I also uh, work a little bit on monitoring at-risk species, um, reporting at-risk species locations and monitoring the outcomes of our habitat improvement projects to see if they work or not. So yeah, a lot of people don't, they always kind of forget like there's animals and there's habitat. Yeah, like, we absolutely. can't just worry yes. about the animals, we have to worry mm -hmm. about habitat. So Jen's gonna bring that tonight too. She's also a very avid birder as well. She's a good birder. Yeah, yeah. So. A good bird crew tonight. There is a lot of birds. That's pretty. Are you happy about that? I mean, it's it's birds. It's, okay. <laughs> that's neat. They're fine. Okay. Um, so anyway, so um, I don't know if all of you guys know this, but Amber and I did some research back in the day um, when we were in college. We yeah. um, we found mice and also mice and bugs and yep. um, snakes. snakes. Uh, yeah, a couple snakes, snakes too. Um, but you know, we had just a goal of finding stuff. There's and a get, bigger and getting a good grade. Yeah, like for and getting we, passing, and here we are. Um, <laughs> We have jobs. So um, what we really want to know is what are the goals of wildlife research? Our goal was just to find stuff, but there's bigger top priority goals when we talk about research. Um, so if you could maybe a few of you touch on this a little bit, just kind of broadly speaking, what are our goals as far as wildlife why, research? Why study wildlife? Yeah. And what do we do with that? Yeah. Who wants to tackle this first? Joel, I see you unmuting yourself. Oh, yeah. Sean, so you guys can fight. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to, Sean already got it going by, I think his, his introduction sort of, uh, Hit the nail on the head by just answering questions. Um, really, that's the that's the role of research is to answer important questions. That's good. I like that. Anybody else want to comment? Not just answering questions, but finding the why. Mm. I would add that in. All right. That's good. So well, I see Will thinking. I don't know. I don't want to deny that. Well, no. I mean, everybody. Everybody's spot on. I just. Just a little plug for you know the, the research section and the things we do. I was granted I was a little biased, but you know I felt that what we did was integral for the rest of the agency and the work that they did on the ground and for what Jen would do. And so the questions come, they ask they ask why or how, and then we investigate and figure that out, and then in turn can then turn that around and put that into management actions or implications on the ground. So. Well, not, to toot, not, not to toot our own horn, but I'd say we we're probably the most important, you know, group of the agency making sure things got done. You can so. say that now that he's not here. Not so. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but something that Will also talked about is, um, you know, they're, you guys are the biologists and you're doing on the ground stuff and we're the ones communicating that. Mm -hmm. So um, we talk about conservation, education and action all being this like three legged chair mm -hmm. and it wobbles without one of them. So mm -hmm. they're all very important. So um, talking through that and we, we kind of know a little bit about broad goals. How do you go about formulating and what is the formula for a research plan? So walking us through like getting a project off the ground from start to finish. What is a timeline or what is a, like what's, a what's the if you what were, are the steps? Yeah, if you're speaking to our participants who have no idea about 
maybe they're not in the science field. What's the recipe for it? How would you do like it? That recipe. Yeah. I'll I'll take a shot at it first. Yeah. You know, I have, and I think you guys asked a really good question, which is, um, you know, what and how do we do these things to begin with? Because I think sometimes biologists and researchers forget that because mm -hmm. it's what we do. I mean, we love to do this stuff and it's just natural for us to go out and, and ask questions and try to find the answer to that. And so I, I like the idea of how do you explain this to someone that maybe doesn't find mm -hmm. insects as awesome as I do? Um, and, and that's a good question because we do have to, we do have to justify what we do sometimes, right? So um, about how we do that, a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, what, what's our priority as far as where this species is doing. So for me, a lot of times when I'm looking at a, a, a lot of projects that we have potential to do, uh, it usually falls upon the species that are in the greatest need. Uh, those that we've noticed their populations are, are declining or dropping. Um, you know, that may be bats from white nose syndrome. It may be insects that we've noticed are severely declining. Um, you know, it could be uh, snake species that all of a sudden we're not seeing as many of. So there's a lot of things that, that come into play, whether it's opportunity for us to do it, it's um, do we have the uh, person power to go out and be able to find uh, these individuals? And then also is the money there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not funding for non-game species isn't necessarily as plentiful as uh, research for game species sometimes. And so when the opportunity comes up, we usually uh, grab that right away and move forward with a project. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is just when the stars align, we go for it. That's but if you ask any biologists, like, what plans would you do if you had unlimited time, manpower, and, you know, opportunity, they'll probably list you off a dozen different projects right okay. away uh, that we would love to do. So it's, it's just uh, when those things line up. That's good. Anyone else want to chime in or agree or disagree? I will completely Please, agree. Disagree. Sweet. I will completely <laughs> agree. Um, basically, it's first we need to know what we need to know. Mm -hmm. So where's the gap in the information? What is the question that we want to answer? That's that's what starts any any of this. Mm -hmm. So what's the question we want to answer? How do we get that information that we need? Do we need to do a field survey? Do we need to go ask the public? Do we need to go just dig a hole and find out? Mm -hmm that kind of thing. And, and then figure out how to make it, how to make it important, mathematically important, statistically significant. Somewhere between step one and four, find the money for it and then go do that thing. That's sweet. I like that. Yeah. That's really good. I mean, science is just easy as digging a hole. I know. Can you make a t-shirt out of that? Like step-by-step -step process calling? Maybe, maybe. maybe. That's pretty cool. How to dig a hole. Yeah. <laughs> totally do that. We can market that too. That's good. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's good. That's a little bit of like the broad, big picture of wildlife research. And I know that they do a whole diversity of um, different projects that they're involved with. So we'll kind of get more into the weeds, so to speak. But for example, one is wildlife research takes tools. And this might be kind of a silly question, but we, we always, it's really fun to hear like tools of the trade um, for people who have different careers. So we want to ask you, what's your favorite or most surprisingly useful tool that you've used in the field? And hopefully this gives a window to our participants of like- Karaoke what, machine. Not a karaoke okay. machine. That's something that we have to use. We, we just bought one. Yeah, so exactly. Not for karaoke, but for its outreach and education. But it's, yes, it's, it's a very important tool yes. um, that we're going to use. So. so what's your favorite tool or most useful or surprising that, uh, I guess, if you were telling like your family member at, during Thanksgiving dinner, they would have no idea what you're talking about or something. Let's hear it. Jen, I see you smiling. I... Um, I mean, I, I don't go anywhere without my binoculars, but maybe the more um, surprising tools, I use a lot of mapping software. And also I use a lot of like empty spice jars and pill bottles because I collect a lot of specimens. <laughs> um, so I always have a bunch of those in my pack and um, 
Are they like I'm falling out of your cup or something like that? Just a bunch of empty jars. <laughs> cool. Thank you. I have a snake hook that I can use. It doubles as a walking stick. I can pick up trash with it. I can move branches with it. And I can pick up the angry snake on the road before it bites me and move it off the road so it doesn't get run over. Perfect. Do you have a snake hook in your truck? Uh, I think you need to learn. I something. don't have it in. It's in my garage. Oh, okay. That's fine. Just very keep that in your car, Monica. Come on. <laughs> I know. It's... Anybody else? I, I would say um, five gallon bucket with a lid. Um, I can take samples with that. I can put snakes in it. I can trap ABV with it, uh, American burying beetles. Um, they're very handy to have. And um, right now there's like, I don't know, close to 20 of them in the back of my truck. So um, they're always nice to have. And then I also carry a, a multi-tool Leatherman with me at all times that everything from fixing fences to helping cut things and get everything ready. So I always have that on me as well. Good. Sounds like a handy man. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Sean. All right. <clears throat> I think we're ready. Yeah. So we kind of talked a little background information. How do you get a project started? What do you want to do with it? What are the goals of that project? So maybe we could take maybe um, one, two minutes tops for each of us. If we all want to go around and kind of talk about one maybe current project that you're involved with. Um, and kind of the goals of that project or what you're hoping to accomplish with that project. So um, would there anyone like to start with that? Um, something current, yeah. Something current, yeah. I can go for you. So awesome. I was going to call you. The awkward before. silence. Um, one project that we've been, I've been involved with um, and Will was involved with when he was at Game of Parks also was a, a project focused on American Woodcock, you know, which people know the timber doodle. Um, a little shorebird uh, that is unlike other shorebirds and likes to hang out in woodlands. Uh, but we've trapped uh, about 15 of those birds and put satellite transmitters on them um, and have been tracking them. And, and when you put uh, transmitters on things with wings that fly around, um, usually just be ready to be sort of um, stunned about what they'll do. So um, that's been kind of a major project the last couple of years. And, and so we we're done trapping those birds. We do it early in spring and now we're just kind of sitting back and watching the, the data roll. Is there something um, surprising that you found from the data so far or something that you're starting to see? So, so far, well, first off, we really didn't know a whole lot. We knew that they were in the state. We knew that they bred sometimes in the state. But we really didn't know a whole lot what they did um, sort of in a wholesale sort of sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the one thing is that about three quarters of the woodcock that show up in Nebraska in spring and display the males, um, about three quarters of them fly north to places like Manitoba and northern Minnesota um, after a few weeks. So it's been it's been pretty eye opening. That's so cool, Joel. And I was wondering if you were going to demonstrate the woodcock um, dance. Um, no, I, I didn't bring my. Uh, my materials for that. So okay, we'll next time. Avoid that for this evening. Totally fine. So. But speaking of that, um, if if our visitors <laughs> aren't familiar with this bird, um, I just need you to search woodcock or timberdoodle, I guess. And if there's some great YouTube clips of them doing this dance, and I'll yep. just do it for you, Joel. It goes a little bit like this. And there's a lot of like music background mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, it's yep. it's amazing. And so they're just super cool birds that people don't realize they're in our state. And also we're doing research on them. So how cool is that? Yeah. That dance is worth it to get the word out. It is. You know, we could include that on our um, stuff that we give our participants as so well. So I didn't have to do that. Oh, no, you still did. Okay. That's we'll fine. just give it to them as well. That's so. perfect. Awesome. Thanks, um, Joel. Yeah. Who's next? Come on. Colleen? Yeah, you just unmuted. So it's your turn. Yeah. So I have two projects to plug and one of them, only one of them is mine. So mine, I'm doing a snake survey in the Lost Canyons area of Nebraska, which Ooh. is this really awesome biologically unique landscape in Dawson and Lincoln counties, a little bit in Frontier County. And it started out as go find the westernmost distribution of speckled king snakes, which are really cool. They're they're black with yellow speckles, really nifty looking snakes. And have that project has evolved into find all of the tier one and tier two species, the species of greatest conservation need of herps that I can possibly find and map their locations. So, so. threatened and endangered species of reptiles in our state. 
basically. Not just threatened and endangered, but species of great, greatest conservation needs. So tier one, all of our tier one species are threatened or endangered. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but all of our threatened and, and endangered species are on the tier one list. Those that are of greatest conservation need, but maybe aren't quite ready to be listed yet are tier one or tier two. Tier two is the lower tier, so. Awesome. So there's that. And then the second thing that I wanted to plug, there is uh, there are butterfly surveys going on pretty oh, shortly cool. with Cody Dreyer, and he's looking at monarchs and regal fritillaries in Nebraska. And there are some trainings that you can go to if you just want to volunteer for you know just four hours of your time to go to these trainings, and then you go get an area and walk these transects, and it's pretty cool. But the trainings are May 21st at SRAM and May 26th on Zoom and June 4th at Homestead in Beatrice. And I'll put up the, the uh, website in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, feel free to do that. And we'll also include it in a resource we send out. That's a really great, great uh, tie-in. So thanks, Colleen, that's great. And Colleen mentioned these things called at-risk species and all this information tiers, different species. She's kind of referring to our um, Rest of Natural Legacy um, project. So which is our state wildlife action plan. Um, it's like a, like 500 page document. So uh, we will cool actually, document. it is, yeah, it's a very good information. It it's our, easy. it's our blueprint yeah. basically for conserving our species. So uh, we will include that um, if anyone is interested in looking at it, just that link to the PDF on our website as well. So that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Jen, Sean, or Will, would you guys like to? Yeah, I can go say, so, you know, one thing that, um, you know, Colleen mentioned earlier too, is that all of these data we collect go to Colleen to help enter into our heritage database where we keep track of all of these data. And that's just one piece of, of a lot of the research we do. Um, but a couple of the projects I've got going on, uh, one of them is the uh, recovery of the Salt Creek tiger beetle, uh, which I'm working now with Will on as part of the NRD. Um, so the Salt Creek tiger beetle, there's so many parts of this, I'll try to sum, summarize this, but it's this really cool little tiger beetle that uh, occurs in the saline wetlands, uh, which are around Lincoln, uh, city of Lincoln, which was established here because of Salt Creek and the salt flats that are in this area. So as of course the city has expanded, um, the available good high quality habitat for this beetle has shrunk. Now, the NRD City of Lincoln, um, uh, Parks and Rec within Lincoln, uh, Pheasants Forever, and many other organizations have really been working to help uh, save this beetle, to learn more about it, how it um, finds its mates, how it lays eggs, how long that takes. All of these things have, have been done. And so right now, our biggest hurdle is uh, making the habitat good quality for these beetles, which restoring saline wetlands is not something that is very common. Mm -hmm. um, the saline wetlands around Lincoln are really rare to have inland saline wetlands that are this saline and very, very salty. Um, and so one of the things that now Will is, is taking over is some of the recovery and restoration of saline wetlands. And that's, that's really unique and something that all uh, Nebraskans should really investigate and look at because it's just a fabulous area, not only for Salt Creek tiger beetles, but for a host of species. Um, one biologist has found over 600 different species of insects wow. that inhabit the saline wetlands around Lincoln. So, I mean, it's just a really unique cool area um, that are now kind of broken up into these mini areas, but lots of them are open to the public and you can absolutely go out there. So getting back to it, what we do is we monitor the populations of Salt Creek tiger beetle, and then we uh, cooperate with several zoos and the university at Lincoln, UNL, uh, to raise tiger beetles and then release them back into the wild to try to um, restore their populations. Uh, one other quick insect I'll mention is American burying beetle, uh, which the largest remaining population that used to be an endangered species just got downgraded to threatened, but the largest population is, is here in Nebraska. Um, the other populations are down around uh, Oklahoma into a little bit Kansas, Missouri kind of area, but we absolutely have the largest one. So 
Um, and we do a lot of tracking of those, trying to keep track of how their populations are doing. I'll stop there. Otherwise, I can keep talking oh, about good. it all night. American bearing beetles and Salt Creek tiger beetles. We'll send some information on that because they are cool looking um, critters. Mm -hmm. They yeah. are. Yes, we and will send some more info. stuff. So that's great. Thank you so much, Sean. Mm -hmm. Will or Jen? Rock, paper, scissors, Jen. <laughs> I can go next. Um, okay, so so I do help out with things like bird surveys and American bearing beetle surveys. Um, one of the things that I do that's probably a little bit different from um, some of the crew on here is uh, we do monitor some of our restoration efforts. So uh, living in, working in central, north central Nebraska, um, I do a lot of work in oak woodlands. Um, we work with private landowners to thin forests, control invasive species, and use prescribed fire uh, to keep those woodlands healthy. And so some of the research we do includes monitoring at some of these sites where we've done all of that work. Um, in particular, one of our projects is partnered with the Nature Conservancy, um, where we are doing um, sampling on the Niobrara Valley Preserve to see how those management actions, the woodland thinning and the prescribed fire are affecting the plant community. Oh, so you're in sampling the plant community? Uh, yeah, I, we're measuring things like uh, tree DBH uh, diameter, tree mm -hmm. diameter, and um, like the number of seedlings of different species, uh, the amount of plant cover that you have on the ground. As we thin these forests, more sunlight is reaching the ground. And so we're hoping for a flush of, of herbaceous growth there on the forest mm -hmm. floor which supports all of our wildlife species. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. we can't forget the plants yeah. and the yeah. other stuff as the well. The whole system. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. And Will? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to tie it all back together. So, you know, part of my job was basically overseeing kind of everybody here that's been talking about all their little things they've been doing. So I don't think I'll focus on one in particular, but just like rattle off like all of the things that we are doing right now across the state. I think people maybe don't realize um, but we have a huge large scale elk research project where we're collaring a bunch of elk out west. Um, mountain lions, we're actively collaring and tracking mountain lions in the Pine Ridge and the Niobrara River Valley and down in the Wildcat Hills. And so that's a big research project that's been going on um, for quite some time and will continue for, for quite a while. Uh, we just finished up a large mule deer project out west where we collared over 240 mule deer does in the southwest and the northwest part of the state. Um, we've collared um, a little over 100 pronghorn now in the state, um, tracking pronghorn movements um, and survival rates across the West and into, um, in the Panhandle and, and in the Sand Hills area. Bighorn sheep research. We have we're, we're researching pheasants, grouse, um, invasive species like eastern red cedar into some of our grasslands and their impact on wildlife species. Um, and, and a whole host of others. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention another thing that we do quite a bit and even more now than we probably ever had is really focusing a lot of our research on human dimensions. Mm. I think that doesn't really get talked about or it kind of gets yeah. overshadowed or overlooked. Like we end up studying people, you know, almost as much as we study mm -hmm. the animals. And that's, that's just as important to us to understand people's perceptions, emotions, their thoughts, their practices, and how they perceive and view the landscape and the animals and how they interact with them. And so, you know, from, from game, from people that interact with game species, people interact with non-game producers, landowners, those are things that we're doing on a constant basis because it is a holistic approach when we're talking about wildlife management, right? So it's not just focusing on where does this one elk walk, but how do landowners perceive those elk and and what interaction do hunters have with those elk and, and all those things because it all fits into like the decision making process of how we manage these species so um, but yeah any any given time we could have 30 40 50 different research projects going on across the state and that's just the wow. ones that we do as an agency and there's other entities doing research as well across the state so there's just a lot going on constantly and, and those things evolve and progress and it's it's really cool to see that's awesome. Well, I remember, I don't know if you felt this way, but um, studying in this field through college and, and beyond, um, you start off and you're so excited to learn about wildlife and get into the science and ecology, and you think that's going to help, you know, change the world. 
And the more you go into the field of wildlife, you realize you have to just learn more about humans. Yeah. And how like we do it to get away from people, right. but you're getting back to those people. We gotta cut it yeah. all comes back. Like, we gotta study we got, we, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's good. you talked yeah. about having 40, 50, sometimes different projects going on. And you talked about all these things that a lot of people might not know about. How do we go about prioritizing what projects? Um, that we want to focus on. I'm sure a lot of us, like Sean said, if we have endless amounts of money, we'd love to do this, this, and this. How do we say, I would love to do this, but this is a more prioritized thing right now. How do we go about doing that or figuring that out? Yeah, um, it's definitely a process. And I think, you know, a lot of what everybody touched on earlier was really focused on the non-game species. Um, and that, and, and, and they were all spot on on that. Now I'll kind of shift to the, the game side of things. And it's a little bit different because we have a, you know, that's our largest constituency is our hunters that fund the research and things that we do. And so really some of these things that we're doing is actually answering the concerns and the, and the questions that our, our hunters, our constituents uh, have about the resource and how we're managing that resource. And, and a lot of those times, those concerns that, that those, those users have are also in line with our, our on the ground managers too. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of intertwined in there and that kind of helps prioritize, you know, where we want to focus some of our, our efforts. Um, and, and another thing about it, and I think, you know, people in the last few years, if you've been involved in seeing the legislative stuff coming around and, and involvement with game parks is really, you know, there is at times where the legislation or political pressure does does do that to us to kind of speed up the process of the things that we kind of want to do, um, kind of puts that into motion, okay, we need to address this. And more re mm -hmm. most recently was the depredation issues, right? And so a lot of it was talked about, about elk and depredation out West. And so that really kind of sped up our train of, okay, we really need to jump on how, what information we have on our elk populations and, and what do we need to get so we can be ahead of this curve so we can really actively manage elk a lot better. So. You know, those political pressures sometimes really play into that um, and we can prioritize that way um, as well as, you know, what our constituents are saying and, and, and what they're concerned about. And we have to be cognizant of that because they are they are paying the bill, you know, whether it's um, whether it's from uh, direct sales of permits um, from licenses, uh, deer tags, those types of things, or they're contributing by buying products that contribute to the Pittman Robertson Fund, which is one of the key funders. Um, what is a federal pot of money that comes to us and so in, in the form of an excise tax that we get in order to invest in, in research and management on the ground in the state. So um, we have to be kind of ready to kind of act on all those different things um, when we're when we're talking about it more on the game side of things. Yeah, that's good. And that, I like that you speak to that, Will, because to some people, I mean, I'm, I'll be real with you, like in college, that stuff was a little bit boring to me because I wanted to get into the ecology, but that is absolutely the reality that we live in in a, a world of wildlife research, not just our agency, but across the country and world yeah. of mm -hmm. how we fund and how we prioritize. That's good. Anybody else want to comment on that one? So I've noticed while I've been here at the agency that there are some of the projects that get done, we partner with so many different different other entities like we partner with with the universities we partner with you know pheasants forever and and ducks unlimited and we, you know, a whole lot of people and so oftentimes our projects are partnered with something that they already have going on we mm -hmm. we have a grad student comes in and says that i want to study landing turtles outside their core range okay let's let's find the funding and we'll partner with you on that and that's that's not actually a project but mm -hmm. it would be cool yeah, that sounds so. <laughs> um, neighboring states projects oftentimes will partner with Iowa or you know Kansas, you know, whoever. Right now, Iowa and Kansas, I can think of that we have, and I think South Dakota, we have a project with going uh, at the moment. Um, whatever the state administration political pressures that will address places where work's been done, places where work hasn't been done in a long time, and places where there's been a major disturbance, like a wildfire. What happens after a wildfire? What happens after the 2019 floods when all the streams finally go down on the flood stage? You know, what, what do we see then? That's, yeah, that's taking advantage of those kind of changes to, to then get in there and study it. That's good. Exactly. I like that. And Will kind of spoke to the opportunistic too a little bit, so that's good. Um, okay, well, speaking of that, especially changes and things, you know, worthy of investigating. We wanna know um, what discoveries or have, have there been some cool discoveries that Nebraska Game and Parks and our partners you know, have been involved with contributing to the greater body of wildlife knowledge. 
So, I mean, if David Attenborough were coming here and speaking to some cool <laughs> stuff we've done, what would he be narrating? That was a weird way to ask that question. I'm sorry. But I understood it. I just, I was just thinking about David Attenborough driving here. So. All right. Yeah. Well, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Are we talking well, discoveries I, or are we talking achievements? Contributing to the greater body of uh, wildlife eco ecological knowledge in the Midwest region. Is that, is that good? How's that? Do you like it? Okay. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I can, I can jump in and go, oh, Joel, go no, ahead, you, Joel. You started talking. <laughs> Joel, Joel is the contributor to the, to the body of, of knowledge that we have on birds and across the Midwest. So Joel, you, you can go. Well, I was going to answer kind of generically. You know, I said we, we go into a research project and we're going to answer a question, and that's the goal. It should be the goal. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what's really exciting about a project is when um, sort of the preconceived notions that you had can completely get blown up and, and what you thought you knew you don't know. Um, certainly, there are, there are occasions when um, you, you, your predictions sort of um, what come, come out in the wash, which you thought was the case, that you collect the data and that turns out to be true. And there's certainly a role for that. Um, but, but again, I like, I like the, the, the projects where, um, again, your mind is completely blown by what you've, what you've discovered. And I think, I think across the board, our agency has contributed to the body of knowledge. Um, you know, we wouldn't be doing research if, if we weren't. I mean, and that can go to a, a variety of different forms. I mean, um, you know, with, with scientific presentations, with a variety of different publications from reports to peer-reviewed articles. Um, you know, I think it's hard to maybe tease out one or two things that, that really sort of are the David Attenborough scale of, you know, PBS discovery sort of thing. <laughs> but, um, you know, and a lot of the things we do are in the applied realm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it is, it is learning how to manage something better. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it may not always be the aha, you know, sort of the, the purely academic scientific realm. So um, one thing that I know that, that we discovered that was pretty cool was um, piping plover, which is a threatened shorebird. Um, you know, we've been doing a color banding project um, on the lower Platte River for about 16 years now. So when you do a project for that long, um, most auto research projects only last for two or three years and then they're done. But, you know, long-term studies have a, have a really big advantage in a lot of ways because you see things you won't see with the short-term studies. So um, we, we've had some interesting results from some of our plovers, um, not only just longevity, um, some, some long-lived plovers living 14, 15 years, but also them doing some crazy things like um, the one thing that I always highlight is um, nesting at a site on the Lower Platte River, um, raising a brood there, and then flying up to um, the Missouri River um, in, on the Nebraska South, of, Nebraska South Dakota border, and then raising another brood all within one breeding season. That was something oh. we really didn't think those birds did. Um, but, but those sort of tidbits are always sort of sprinkled throughout any research project. So. That's really cool. Yeah. I think there was a and correct me, Will, if I'm wrong, there was a, a mule deer or something that we kind of found that was like, that went so long and then came back. I was just He's like, excited. Okay. Cause I'm, I thought it was right cool. Yeah. Fun. We learned about it at our division meeting and I just yeah. was sitting there like, oh my God, I want to write a book about is this. It, and does it yeah. have a name here? She, like we need to name this a creature. Talk, yes. Let's, we'll yeah. shut up. We okay. want to hear it. Uh, well, I'm glad you brought that up, Monica, because I have the slides for that yes, particular yes. doe. Sure, let me make sure you but I, yeah, let me, but while you're, so while you're doing that, Amber, I, I'll just touch on that. So like Joel mentioned, birds with wings and transmitters, they move. Well, the cool thing with animals that have four legs, they also move and they can also move very far. Right. Um, and, and a lot of times that, that really surprises us. Um, we see some really cool, unique movements and I'll touch on a few of them here. There's this mule deer I'll talk about. And then I also have a slide from some of the pronghorn that we have pollard, which are really cool and unique. But um, let me get this shared quickly. All right, you seeing my slideshow? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so yeah, so this is a really unique thing. Just like Joel, Joel mentioned, we have these like cool tidbits of these random things we don't expect. Um, and this is one up in the Pine Ridge and as a, a mule deer doe we had collared in February of 2020. Mm -hmm. And the really cool thing which you can see here is 
that during the spring, so the blue colored line, she decided in about March that she wanted to take off to Wyoming. And so she did, and she did quite quickly. In about seven days, she went from uh, in the grasslands, um, uh, uh, in the Ogallala grasslands, and she went all the way to her winter, winter range over, um, over near Lusk, Wyoming. Seven and days, spent, how many miles a day is that? Yeah, so she was, I don't remember how many miles a day that was in particular, but it's 110 kilometers, so it's about 70 miles she did, so roughly six days, so she was doing on average, you know, about 10 miles a day yeah. or so, uh, making that trek, but the really cool thing, which we didn't really expect, was that Right away in October, when she was done hanging out in her winter range, she came right back. And so, or in her summer range, and she came right back, or vice versa. Sorry, I got it mixed up. But anyway, the cool thing is that when she decided to come back, she came back on the exact same yeah, path. Easy, she was here, cool. All the way back to the same site where we had collared her uh, mm -hmm. seven months before that. So, really really cool this is something where we would say that this is um you know what we would consider a mule deer migration of sorts at least for this group um and something we never expected to really see um you know you hear about this stuff out west in wyoming and montana and colorado all these other states that have these um, but we didn't see that but here's a cool picture of her on her way as she started to kind of move um and that's her right there with the collar on with a group mm -hmm. of a uh, couple other does so we, we can't confirm whether she took all those does with her or not. They all went together, but uh, we knew she went and she came right back. So it's a little ladies really, trip. really cool. <laughs> Girl yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just hanging out. So, um, and quickly, you know, to mention pronghorn do some really cool things. And here's a kind of a cool interactive map we have showing these pronghorn that were collared north of Alliance out in the, in the, uh, the agricultural dominated landscape there. And you can see that in February, she decided to leave and then head out into the sand hills and did about another 50, 60 mile movement in a few days um, to where she wanted to hang out down here um, for the rest of the summer where she hung out. Um, so again, really fascinating things. We see these like seasonal movements where they're here, they're foraging and then boom, they're gone. We're gonna go hang out in the sand hills and eat grass the rest of the summer. And then we see in the winter time when we have some snowfall events or things get colder, um, and more harsh, they move back into those ag dominated landscapes. So it's kind of intuitive. You would say, okay, they're going to go get better food in the winter time, but mm -hmm. it's still real neat to see how that is impacted. Um, a couple others, we had these mule deer or these pronghorn bucks collared, and some were moving 80 to 90 some miles doing these big long movements to the sand hills. One, this one was collared here, that went out into the sand hills, went all the way down here. Um, near the Platte River, North Platte River, and then came all the way back up and around and ended up back where you got colored. So just That's really cool. cool, unique things. Um, and now we can show people, you know, these, these animals do move. Um, they do strange things. They move long distances. Um, and it's really cool. One last thing about the pronghorn too, and then I'll, and I'll stop. But um, we actually had a um, four or five does that were collared in different places north of Alliance along that ag dominated area where I showed that little map just a little while ago. Mm -hmm. And they all eventually moved through the sand hills. And what's really neat is there's a specific highway going north south through the sand hills where all four of those does crossed in the exact same location across mm -hmm. that highway, but they crossed at different times in different groups. So mm -hmm. they were never with one another, but they all cross in the exact same path. So that's a really cool area where we're saying, okay, this might be a corridor we really need to yeah. focus on wildlife friendly fence or really figure out what's going on here but Maybe that for whatever reason more research then yeah absolutely so mm -hmm. the cool thing about research is it generally leads to more questions um, which is mm -hmm. fun but just really unique things that we've heard of other states but as we start to do this in Nebraska we start to see some of the same things so wow. really cool stuff that's really neat thanks for sharing I'm glad you had visuals yeah that was yeah. a requirement so don't worry you just get like I guess the gold star <laughs> above and beyond thank you anybody else or discoveries that you want to share? Jen, you- I One know. of the things that came yeah. to mind was um, when we we first started looking at American burying beetles in this state, and up until then, people had thought of them as a forest associated species. Uh, and as we started doing more and more survey work in Nebraska and elsewhere in the Great Plains, um, we began to realize that here they're grassland associated and they actually have some mm. negative relationships with um, certain, certain tree, types 
Um, so that's that was kind of that sort of switched up how everybody was thinking about those beetles and how they might um, stabilize populations. That's really cool. And you said negative relationships. Do you mean like they actually are not found where there are certain trees? Right. So uh, we we deal a lot with uh, eastern red cedar that is invading grasslands. Um, and we found that American bearing beetles really avoid places where there's mm -hmm. dense cedar canopy cover. Um, oh. So that's one of the takeaways from some of the research they've been doing. That's good. And maybe like Will said, it sounds like, to me like a lot of the stuff you spoke about, each of you, just it had me like having more questions. Yeah. Like what, like I was curious about why then, and then it's just like a continual cycle of you find the why. Like it's, the why. it's literally yeah. never ending. And like, yeah. that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's why. Job security. Yeah, exactly. We always have stuff. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> Very cool. Um, so we mentioned, um, you know, we think it's really neat to see this, but like the average person that you meet on the street, why do you all think that it's important for, especially like Nebraska citizens to be engaged with the research that we are doing or um, what, that's happening across our state? Or why should, you know, why should they care? The yeah. question, why, do, why should they care? Yeah. Anyone want to speak to that? So I do a lot of research with, with rattlesnakes in particular, mm -hmm. and most people don't think of rattlesnakes as something fuzzy and warm and cuddly that we want to snuggle up to. Like, she you know, does. Yeah, I mean, Monica, does, I do, but yeah. we're on the same wavelength, but <laughs> great minds. If, if people have a stake in the game, if people participate, if they see that show and tell, if they realize that, oh yeah, these, these snakes are on my property. Oh, they are beneficial. Once they have a stake in the game, they'll they'll take ownership of it. And I've heard landowners say, oh, well, you know, these are my snakes and they're really cool about it. And they, they get really excited about it. They tell their friends and they tell their family. I've also had landowners say, I'm just going to find a shovel and cut their head off. Mm -hmm. I get it. They're not for everybody. Again, it's not the most charismatic taxa, but snakes are cool. Don't cut their heads off. They play that's an ecological role. And they make a connection. That's to that cool. Animal. And yes. Colleen, I really like that you spoke to getting maybe people, landowners, whoever, from from a fear to almost like a pride and like a taking pride in stewardship. Yeah. That is like the goal. That's really the fear and the respect can still be there, but right. there's still ownership. There's still right. a, the, the idea of stewardship. Yes, it's not just I'm a steward of the land. It's I'm a steward of everything that lives on the land. Yes, absolutely. That's really cool. I mean, I'm excited. I'd be. I'm even excited I have my own lichen species in my backyard. Like I feel stewardship and ownership over them. So like, I think we can all get there. Yeah, maybe we'll get there, <laughs> we'll get there. Um, anybody well, else, How, why should they care? Go ahead, Joel. Well, and just carrying that stewardship concept forward. I mean, I, I think research, the, the goal of research, whether we're talking game species or, or species of conservation concern, threatened endangered species, those things. I mean, I think we all have, there's, there's various challenges in managing wildlife resources. Um, so hopefully one thing that research is intended, intends to do is to help us achieve the goal of, of steward, our stewardship of our wildlife resources. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the bearing beetle, I didn't know, you know, what example was a, was a good example. If we were managing, trying to manage um, bearing beetles here in, in Nebraska by creating woodlands or managing woodlands, we would be doing it wrong. So if we yeah. weren't doing things like that, you know, Again, we'd be ineffective and we want to be effective at what we're doing. Um, Absolutely. So. That's good. Well, and the, and the other thing too, you know, the kind of just cap it off, I think, is just that the work that we do and, and to make it beneficial on the landscape, I mean, our state is 97% privately owned. So we need landowners and we need them to care and we need that investment and engagement. And that's why positions like Jen and the work she does with private landowners is so crucial and so important. Um, to make strides in the world of con conservation in Nebraska. And so that ownership, that buy-in, that support, you know, really helps us be effective just all around in everything we do. So, um, you know, we really rely and depend on those landowners and, you know, we appreciate them. So if you guys are here and your landowners have let us out there, or if you're willing to let us out there at some point, thank you, um, you know, for, for all your help and and work because without without you all, we, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do and be as impactful. So it's really important to, to give that recognition. Yeah. It, and I'll just add real quickly too. I, I think there's also a number of instances or examples out there where you know the public, the stakeholders that are involved with X species, whether it be a TNE species or a game species, have the same question sometimes. You know, you may mm -hmm. arrive having arriving at the same question yeah. and says, we need to answer this collectively and, and kind of we're the staff that. Um, carries it out with, you know, working with collaborators and everything else. So it's, it's often not, 
the public is just consumers of, of research, but they're often sometimes, you know, there in, at, at the beginning as well. That's good. That's good. That's part of the process. Um, okay, I think we have one last like question from us to ask. And then we, we got incredible questions from our participants tonight. And we want to make sure to do that lightning round in the last five minutes um, at the end to get as much of these answered as we can in a quick fashion because I'm so excited when people enter their questions. Like, this is what the yeah, program's for. That's what it's for. Right. Yep. So very cool. So our last question for all of you, and I'd love to hear an answer from everyone if you if you would like to, it's kind of a fun one. Yeah. Is if you uh, we talked a little bit about prioritizing wildlife research, we talked about there's different needs for it um, and different methods, but we want to know from you. <clears throat> What do you feel, what do you think the greatest future needs are in wildlife research in Nebraska? And if you had a magical funding wand, what project would you fund to meet those needs? That's kind of a big question. You can you can speak to that or you can just like your if you could go like this and and research anything to your heart's content, what would it be? Is that too big of a question? I'm sure they're ready for it. I hope they're excited. I feel like everyone has this question yeah. inside. Like I think about all the education just gonna, programs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, okay, Jen. Or, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna kick this off, and I would say that with unlimited funding, I would love to know where our bat populations are within the state, where they move, how they move, um, and where they're hibernating. We have a lot of very difficult regions in the state to get to, and I don't know if you know uh, a lot of people have seen a live bat but they can squeeze into you know, areas that are about a quarter of an inch high. I mean, very small. And um, they are very difficult to track because unlike you know, Joel's birds or Will's um, uh, pronghorn, it's really difficult to put a transmitter on them that will last and that you can pick up with an antenna. So um, it can be done, but it's very, very labor intensive and expensive. And so I think that's one of the main things that I would do. Good. So we'll 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 be on the lookout for funding for that, Sean. Yes, please. For your birthday. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Who's ready, Jen? Um, I would say a thorough evaluation of how plants and wildlife are responding to our habitat improvement projects. We do a lot of work with private landowners here in Nebraska, and we have certain uh, <laughs> monitoring projects going on, but. Um, if there was a way to somehow look at every project we do and say, hey, did this work? What could mm -hmm. we have done that would make it better? Um, that would be so helpful for, for prioritizing how we do conservation moving forward. That's great. That's an excellent That's a good one. point. Yeah. I'm speaking more to like a method than a, than a thing. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Cool. Joel, you were going to, you were about to go, I think. Well, I'm just going to say, I don't know how to answer this question because we spent so much time thinking about what we can actually do as a project that... Are you, you mean you don't dream anymore? Is that what... Yeah, I, I do dream, but when you say, you know, it's, I could give you a thousand possibilities and be happy, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how to handle that sort of <laughs> Freedom. Um, oh, possi possibility. possibility. I don't mm -hmm. know, yeah, I don't know how to handle that level of possibility. Um, it's just, because sort of, there's so yeah. many things I would like to do. Okay. That's fair. Okay. So it wouldn't be like really a thorough investigation of the woodcock mating dance and like the patterns of it. But why not one go crew or something else? You know, I mean, you can just go okay. on and on and on with possibilities. <laughs> something birds, I'm assuming. I'm getting that. Vibe. Unless he's going to the pronghorn, he's jumping back. He uh, might. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Will or Colleen? All of the things. Yes, just all of the things like like Joel said, the possibility too much possibility leads to chaos and then it's entropy and we, we just can't have that. Oh my God. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. I I'm like Joel. I don't know how you answer that. I did we break our ex? <laughs> yeah. I, I think we need yeah, to. Yeah. I, <laughs> I well. Yeah, I think I think that's the that's the I would say that's probably one of the one faults, which I think is a good fault that we have is that we are we are realists in the things we do and we try to be um, responsible in how we develop our projects and prioritize, you know, we kind of talked about that so we don't let ourselves dream because if we let ourselves dream it kind of gets us astray from what needs to be done or the things that need to happen but 
I'll just put in a plug and say, you know, the state wildlife action plan that we have, the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project, really lays out there's a lot of species of, of concern that we have in this state that are that are vastly understudied. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things that may be coming, if people have heard about it, is RAWA, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which will bring a tremendous amount of funding, approximately $16 million a year to Nebraska to help fund efforts to address those needs for those species. So I'm dreaming about RAWA. I'm going to dream that RAWA is going to happen and we're going to have so much money to, to really get after all these questions we have about the, the hundreds of species we have listed as greatest conservation need in the state and am excited to see where that goes. Fingers crossed. So in 10 years after all this RAWA money and we've had it for a while, we will do this again. And then we can ask, we can get some, we, I know we have so much money. What are something you wish we had less money? Of? <laughs> like we would know less about species. So yes. All right, so we've heard a lot from our experts tonight. Um, We do have a few questions that our audience um, submitted when you guys registered. And like Amber said, they were really awesome this time. Yeah, they were very And we wanna make sure that we answer a couple of them. So usually during our lightning round, we will, um, not everyone has to respond, but we will just kind of ask a question. And then if you have an answer, um, just kind of quickly as possible um, so that we can move through them. So Joel, I'm gonna just point you out right away because we had a couple of people ask about avian flu. Um, is Demon Parks doing anything as far as research or what's going on with that? And specifically, p- um, people ask me where to take dead birds. So if you want to speak to that. In a- well, yeah, well, we're, we're involved with a number of other partners monitoring the avian influenza situation and has impacted a number of, of uh, wild birds, you know, primarily water birds, things like waterfowl, but also raptors to a certain degree. Um, you know, birds die all the time. Um, birds died before this wave of avian influenza, so not all birds need to be tested for avian influenza, but if they do observe dead birds, they should contact their Game of Parks office, um, and uh, we can sort of assess whether um, this is a situation where we should, uh, you know, do some testing. So, but but I guess the good, the, the, the good news with sort of the avian influenza situation is, you know, migrations passed for one thing, um, so maybe birds aren't as concentrated as they were in spring, but also the warmer weather hopefully is a, is a, will help um, dampen the, the virus transmission. Um, you know, war- viruses don't do well in warmer weather. So hopefully that means that this particular wave will be subsiding very soon. That is good to hear. Very good. We also had someone ask about, um, is there any mo- noticeable changes um, in as far as the migration patterns of certain Nebraska wildlife? I'm, I mean, that could be lots of different things, but one thing that comes to mind is birds. Is there anything that you have to say about that? Yeah, um, you know, certainly there are changes in the environment and birds respond to those changes in the environment. So we are seeing some different migration patterns. Um, Some of that is associated with uh, climate change. Um, You know, uh, I think it's been demonstrated that like for instance, sandhill cranes are, are arriving sooner and peaking sooner. Um, myself and a colleague wrote a paper on whooping cranes uh, a couple of years ago, highlighting how their migration is occurring earlier in spring and, and later in fall. Um, and then, you know, we also see some, some changes in animal distributions in response to just land use, you know, and, and the redistribution of resources. So, um, and that's kind of one of the challenges out, you know, out there is, is um, you know, Birds, animals, they're not static in what they do necessarily. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they are, but they're also responding to these changes in the environment and change is just, an, is always occurring, so. Yeah, that's good. Um, we also had someone um, on the chat ask about, and this might be a Joel slash Sean question. Is there any research being done on the danger risk of migrating bats or birds from wind turbines? Um, any conservation plans with that? And then does Nebraska have any bats that are endangered because of white known syndrome? I'll yeah. just oh. oh you I'll leave the bat stuff for Sean, but we have done some research on um, wind turbines and bird impacts. We we funded a study with Lark and Powell um, through the University of Nebraska Lincoln looking at um, prairie chickens uh, response to wind turbines. Uh, but there's also been other studies, and we also work um, with wind companies to help evaluate risk to, to migrating birds um, and try to steer them away from areas where there's um, high numbers, high densities of, of migrating birds. So I'll, I'll say that and then leave it, turn, turn it over to Sean. That's good. Yeah, Joel mentioned our, our kind of what we have, our, our wind and wildlife guidelines that um, for both birds and bats primarily, 
Uh, and that has helped a lot, uh, kind of keep wind turbines out of areas where we suspect uh, we would have most problems. We also have some things, um, not necessarily research, but some monitoring where we have um, the wind companies after they put up the turbines, uh, they will make sure that they'll go through and do surveys after the wind turbines are going and operating to look for dead bats. So we have an idea of how much of an Im impact it will have on the population. As far as endangered species, we do have the Northern long ear bat, uh, which was threatened and right now is under review for potentially being upgraded to endangered. And then there's two other bats here, um, the uh, uh, little brown bat and the tricolor bat. Uh, both of those are potentially um, going to be listed as endangered soon. And all three of those species that I've mentioned are being impacted by white nose syndrome. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a terrible fungus. It, is, it has really decimated a lot of species of bats here in North America. And, and we are absolutely seeing the effects, uh, effects of that in Nebraska. Hmm. Okay. I didn't mean to end on a bad note. No, I know. But, uh, um, sorry. It's okay. I know it's 802. If, if anyone would like to stay on a few more minutes, we have a few really quick, good questions and then wrap up. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, for example, this one, I just really like this question. Um, really, basically, it's a question of, or I'm going to combine it into two parts. Okay. Number one, how should people learn about the research that Game and Parks does? I mean, like, Listen to how many amazing things we're doing tonight. It's incredible. And we have this program, of course, but what are some ways that we would put them to, um, you know, to learn more about the kind of, do we have a newsletter? What's happening with like wildlife research on the ground? And then also um, opportunities to get involved, especially in that community science realm. Um, did you speak to that at all? I know there's a community science specialist on our division and she really helps um, oversee community science and citizen science across the state on our behalf. So we'll, we'll put um, some information about yes. how to get involved in there, but can you speak to how the public should um, stay up to date and what kind of cool stuff we're doing and how they can get involved? Anyone want to speak to that? Absolutely. Um, so I would, I would say that if you want to keep up on some of the research going on, you can go to our website, outdoornebraska.gov slash RAI. Mm -hmm. And I created that website with our communications department while I was there. And on there, you'll find a newsletter I was producing once every couple months. Um, and so there's probably four or five or six maybe newsletters on there. And what's um, RAI I'm, stand for, Will? By the way, RAI, I know. But don't say yeah. Uh, RAI is an acronym that stands for Research Analysis and Inventory. And that's the mm -hmm. section that, that most of these folks here are in. Um, and so we, I created that website so that people can get a glimpse of what research is going on across the state and kind of figure out who those people are that are conducting those research projects. So um, each one of those newsletters that's on there, you can click and download, and there's some really cool articles on there um, uh, to check out, and that'll keep you up to date. And hopefully um, whoever takes my spot can keep that going because I think it's a great outlet for people to, to stay up to date on some really cool things going on. Um, the other page that, that, that they can go to is outdoornebraska.gov slash wildlife surveys. Mm -hmm. And on that wildlife surveys page, it gives you access to all of the wildlife surveys that we conduct for our various game species. So our turkey brood surveys, our turkey hunter harvest surveys, our um, any of our deer hunter surveys, like all of those, the waterfowl surveys, like all those surveys are in a one-stop shop. So people can take a look at those. Those are annual surveys that are done. Um, and stay up to date with, with what we're finding um, on some of these things. So those are two really good spots to, to check out um, and, and, and stay up to date. That's great. And Thank we you. will, oh, Jen wants to, Jen oh yeah, go ahead. Well, oh, Jen. I was going to say, we also have a, an annual conference called the Nebraska Natural Legacy Conference where a lot of us present. So um, you can go to the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission website and just search for that Nebraska Natural Legacy Conference and it should pop up with the, the series think, plans for that. And I think it's usually in the year. fall, like in October or so. Yep, and it'll be out in um in Shadron in the fall in October yeah. this year. So yeah, and it's it's the trip. public is welcome. So <laughs> we encourage the public to come even. Yeah. Um, so all of this information was um awesome that we received tonight and all the 
links and like newsletters and um, everything that you gave us, we will include as much of that as we can. So everyone that registered for this tonight will get an evaluation tomorrow to fill out where to find the live version of this if they'd like to watch it again or um, share it with somebody. And then all those links, PDFs, information, There's we will send so that many out. Resources so tonight. many resources yes. tonight. You yes. guys will have some homework to do. Yeah. But they're nature nerds. So cool. that's okay. Yeah. And yeah. speaking of nature nerds, um, we're going to take our show on the road, mm -hmm. like not virtual, but like in person. And tomorrow is one of our in-person nights. So if you are in Lincoln, if you're in Wayne, if you're in Elkhorn, North Platte or Scott's Bluff, we will have a virtual trivia night. No statewide in person yes yeah, sorry did i say virtual i know it's just been we're such used a, to it but we're so excited sorry. to be in person in tomorrow. person trivia night tomorrow at some local breweries throughout those five locations um it's free you go ahead and come it's just with a purchase you gather a team of a nature nerds um mm -hmm. and look we have five nature nerds right here yeah maybe you guys can form a team and oh, come man. to anyway Hope the questions are hard enough Okay. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so if you'd like to come to that, that would be great. We will um, give you information on that as well. I will try to send this out tomorrow morning right away so that you can have that information. Um, but otherwise, our next virtual Nature Nerd Night will be June 21st. And Sean, you're going to be back on again, I think, talking about invertebrates. Um, so it's all about the non-backbone the creatures. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wait, yeah. when is that? I need to put on my calendar. We'll talk we'll, tomorrow. We'll talk. Yeah. We'll okay. send you information. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we really appreciate you guys taking your time. And I hope that everyone kind of learned a little bit more about what Game and Purse is doing. As I feel far like as I, I even learned. Oh, like yeah. Always do. Oh, yeah. That's why I do this. Mm -hmm. It's not for the visitors. It's, it's for us. <laughs> this is a front. Yeah. Well, thank right. you so much, guys. You were excellent. I appreciate your time and knowledge and your content tonight. And we'll we'll see you around. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye.